Welcome back to our class on reaching new levels of faith. I'm so glad that you've decided to continue with this series and I hope that you really benefit. Like I said in the first class, I am just really pumped up about sharing this information with you. I believe it's gonna be a life changer for you if you will stay with this whole series and learn the different levels of faith that I'm gonna be teaching you. Uh, I wanna encourage you again, have your Bible in front of you if you can. I understand some of you, you may not be able to be in a position where you do that or you may not even have a Bible handy, but if you can have a Bible and have it open and look at the scriptures with me, you'll get a lot more out of the lesson. I also wanna encourage you to get your hands on the student workbook. You can get that, you can order it through bibletalk.tv or you can download it as a PDF, it's a free download. And that way you can follow along. And then when you see things up on the screen, when you see words that are underlined, that's what goes in the blanks to fill in in your notes. And that helps you to pay attention a little better. And there's plenty of room in there for you to write other scriptures. I might reference, sometimes a scripture just comes to mind and you can just write that in. Another thing you can do with that is if you look on there and some of the passages are underlined, if it's underlined, that means we're gonna to turn to it and read it. And I've already got my congregation trained, they understand this, that whenever they see a passage underlined, we're turning to it. Now, if it's not underlined, that means I'm gonna reference it or I'll just put it up on the screen for you so you can see it. But uh, if you see a scripture underlined, you can start turning to that ahead of time. And that's where we'll be. And you can turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 11, by the way, because that's where we're going to be in a little while. As I think about the times that we're living in right now, we need faith more than anything. I mean, it's such confusing times. I found this, this sign I thought kind of states the way I feel sometimes. The sign says always open and then on it says closed. I mean, we're getting mixed signals from the world. And, and here's another one I thought was really interesting. It says lane closed to ease congestion. We're being told this helps or that helps and we're like, we just don't really know what to believe. What should we put our faith in? And so I wanna to explain to you what faith is, first of all. What is faith? We're gonna be talking about this for the next 14 classes. We probably ought to get a good grip of what this is. And I'm gonna start with some basic dictionary type definitions, and then we'll, uh, we'll get more into what the Bible says here in a little bit. But the first definition really is the judgment that something stated is truth. Now, when you hear something on the news or you see something online, you have to decide, am I gonna put faith in that? Do I believe that's true, in other words? Because we, we've learned over time, hopefully you've learned that not everything that is said is true, not everything that's on the internet is true. And so faith is, it involves a judgment. You have to make a judgment. Is this true? Is it right? Second definition is a belief which causes you to do what you do. You know, it's hard to define the word faith without using the word belief. They are interchangeable, and even more so in the Greek, uh, pistis and pistuo are the two words for faith and belief, and they're just so closely related. But your belief system is what causes you to do things on a daily basis. Whatever you did yesterday, you did that because you believe that was the right thing to do or, or based on your, your structure of your, your faith, that's how we make decisions. So a definition of faith is the belief which causes you to do what you do. Thirdly, belief is to put your full weight down upon a cause to put your full weight down upon a cross. Probably need to explain that one to you. I wanna show you a picture of a grass bridge. They make these in Peru. What they do is the, the tribes get together and they weave this grass together and they make these bridges so they can get across these high ravines. And then as they're going across these things though, and over time, these bridges start to decay, as you might imagine, they're, they're only made of grass. And so as they'll come up on one, a, a whole group of people, and they're getting ready to cross, sometimes they'll pause and they wanna make sure that that bridge is going to work. I heard the story about a missionary who went down to Peru and he was trying to translate the Bible into their language. And they did not have a word for faith. 
He's trying to describe it to him. They're saying, mm, no, no, no word like that. One day he's walking with the men and they're traveling and they come up on one of these bridges and rather than just walk out on that thing, they, they get the most insignificant guy in the tribe, I guess, and say, hey, go check the bridge out. And so that guy goes out and he doesn't just walk out on it either. He puts a little toe on it, a little more weight, a little more weight, and then he gets to the point he puts his full weight down upon the bridge. And they have a word for that. And when the missionary heard that, he says, Aha, ah, there's my word for faith. Faith is to put your full weight down. And think about it in their Bible, like Mark chapter 16 and verse 16 would say, Whoever puts his full weight down on Jesus and is baptized will be saved. Interesting way to think about the word. Let me share another picture here with you. This is uh, Charles Blondin, or Blondin the Great, as he was known, and he was a great uh, tightrope walker. Uh, this particular picture is stretched, a tightrope that's stretched across Niagara Falls. And he would walk across that thing. In this picture, he's actually pushing a wheelbarrow across Niagara Falls. The story is told that one time he was pushing it across, and of course, there's, you can see people in the background there on the bridge, and there would be crowds on both sides, and he got to one side, and they're cheering for him. Oh, that was wonderful the way you did that, how you walked that wheelbarrow all the way across there. He says, how many of you believe I could do that again, that I could turn around and go right back? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're great. We know you could do this again, no doubt about it. He says, okay, who wants to get in the wheelbarrow? Faith is getting in the wheelbarrow. That is, that's what it means to, to get in God's wheelbarrow and say, I trust you to walk me across. I'm putting my full weight down upon you, God. That's what faith is. Let's talk about another definition here. Faith is the ascent of the mind to a conviction of biblical truth. I underlined the word mind there. I probably could have underlined the word conviction because I love that word, conviction. Boy, we need good old-fashioned conviction in the church, amen? We need people who have conviction about what they believe. That's what faith is. When you ascend the mind to that point, I have a conviction about this biblical truth. I've studied it through. I know this is right. I'm going to stand on it. I'm going I'm to send my mind to that point. I trust that this is a truth from God's Word. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about faith. Let me give you another definition here. Faith is confidence to rely on Christ in making faith moral choices. We all have to have a standard that we live by. This is, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what I'm not going to do. When we're talking about faith, we're talking about you placing your confidence, relying on Christ in making these good moral choices. I don't know if you've ever done this before. Have you ever seen this? It's called a faith fall. In a faith fall, you're up on a table or a platform and you're supposed to just fold your hands and fall back and let your friends catch you. In this particular picture, I noticed that the guy has a hold of his legs. I'm not sure what that's all about, I guess, so he doesn't cheat. But, but it takes a lot of faith to just fall back and let people catch, catch you. You have to have faith that they're not going to let you just fall on the ground. Isn't that what faith is with God? It, when we talk about faith, aren't we saying, God, I just trust you. I'm just going to fall back and just let you catch me. That's faith. Trusting God to the extent that you're just like, I don't know how I'm going to handle this situation, God, but I trust you. I'm falling back into your arms. I'm leaving this in your hands. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about faith. All right, let's look at, it, at the, uh, what the Bible says. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, a verse that I'm, I'm sure most of you thought we were going to get to here eventually. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Let's read that again together. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen seen. Let's take the first part of that verse. Faith is the assurance 
of things hoped for. Assurance means to be sure. I can be sure about this. Okay? I am sure about these things that I hope for. So think for a moment about what do you hope for when you come to church and when you uh, approach Christ with your life? What is something that you're hoping for? Well, I know what I'm hoping for is I'm, I want to be sure that God can change me. And I want to be sure that God can change you. Let's look at two scriptures about that. The first one is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The church in Corinth had buku problems. They, they were a mess. They weren't taking the Lord's Supper right. Uh, they didn't understand uh, marriage and divorce. Uh, they had, they had a, a guy living in immorality and nobody was doing anything about it in chapter 5. They had division in chapter 3. Uh, the, the church in Corinth just had all sorts of problems. But look at the way that Paul talks to them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and he acknowledges their problems. He says in verse 9, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Whew, that's quite a list there. He says people that live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God, period. But here's the encouraging part. Look at verse 11. Such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. He says, such were some of you. You might underline were in your Bible. It's underlined in mine. Such were some of you. What does that mean? They weren't that anymore. There were members of the church there in Corinth who used to be adulterers and fornicators and homosexuals and drunkards and, and swindlers. They weren't anymore. Such were some of you. You were washed of that. You were cleansed of that. You can be sure of that. I need to be sure that God can change me. If I don't, I have a faith problem. I'm not trusting God. If I come to church and I'm reading the Bible and I'm still telling myself, oh, I'm never going to change. I'm just going to be the same way. I have a faith problem. Or if I say that about others, oh, he's never going to change. He comes forward every other Sunday and it's just always the same thing. He's that is a faith problem. I need to be sure that God can change me. I need to be sure that God can change you. Paul was confident in the book of Philippians. Uh, look at that with me, please. Philippians. Chapter 1, and Philippi, th that church had its problems too. Go back and read in the book of Acts how that church got started. It, it, was not, uh, it wasn't a rosy situation at all. And yet look at the way that Paul writes to the church in Philippians chapter 1, and I'm going to start here in, in verse 3. Philippians 1 verse 3. I thank my God... In all my remembrance of you, always offering prayers with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. For I'm confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. See the way he talks to them? He's like, you know, I'm just so thankful to God for you. When I pray to God, I thank you for those, that church there in, in Philippi. I love those Philippians so much. And I'm confident God started a good work in you, and He's going to keep going. I'm sure of that. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. I am sure God can change you. I am sure God can change me. There's just certain things that we need to be sure about. Let me share some others with you. I need to be sure that I will be in heaven with God. Do you have that assurance? You know, I hear a lot of times Christians say, Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll make it. I, I probably won't. Man, what kind of faith is that? Don't you trust God? In Hebrews chapter 11, and please be turning back there. 
Hebrews 11 is kind of the, the hall of faith, if you will, in the Bible. It talks about the great men and women of the Bible and, and how they had tremendous faith. But I want you to notice maybe something you haven't if you've read this passage before. Have you ever noticed the references to heaven and their confidence in heaven? Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to a place which he was to receive for an inheritance. No, it's talking about the promised land, right? And he went out not knowing where he was going. Now that takes faith, doesn't it? By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. Now here's... Here's the key verse, verse 10. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now I wonder what that city is that he's talking about. He's looking for a city whose architect and builder is God. It's obviously not talking about something here on earth. That's talking about a city to come. He's talking about how he's looking forward to being in heaven with God. Uh, drop down to verse 13 with me. It says, By faith, all these died in faith, without receiving the promise, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Verse 14, For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Remember, they feel like strangers here on earth. They're seeking a country of their own. Verse 15, and indeed, if they had been thinking of the country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. They're looking forward to another place. And they are sure, they have that confidence of heaven, being in heaven with God. Look also at verse 24, not to be redundant, but just all the way through, you just see this, this idea of putting their faith in, trusting that there is something greater to look forward to after this life. Verse 24, by faith Moses. Okay, let's talk about Moses for a little bit. When he had grown up, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Most of us know that story about how he had the opportunity to stay in Pharaoh's house, but he gave that up when he saw the way the Hebrew slaves were being abused and he learned about the God that he didn't know about. But he left behind the glory and the splendor of Pharaoh's house to be able to do that. It says in verse 25, choosing rather to endure ill treatment with the people of God, with the Hebrews, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. You notice the Bible says that sin is pleasurable, does not deny that. Yeah, there's some pleasure to sin, but is it worth sacrificing heaven? That's his point here. He gave up the pleasures of sin. He endured the ill treatment of the people of being with the people of God. Why did he do that? Verse 26, he was considering the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking to the reward. Heaven is our reward. Heaven's not our goal. I've heard people say that and, and I understand what they mean, but really heaven is not the goal because when you think about it, when we are immersed into Christ, we're going to heaven. If that's the goal, then we're done. No, our goal is to glorify God, to be more like Christ, to share our faith with as many as we can. There's, there's more goals that we have on earth. But our reward is heaven. The reason we do these things is we're looking forward to that reward. We get to be in heaven with God. All these were, had that, that assurance. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, is really not a definition of faith, although it's, it's not a bad one, but it, it's more of a description of here's what faith does. Faith has the assurance 
of things that we hope for, that when we have faith, we are sure God can change me, sure that God can change others, sure that I'm going to be in heaven with God. That's what faith is. It is also, in the, the next section here, it is the conviction of things not seen. There's our word again, conviction. I just, I love that word so much. How's your conviction? How strong is your conviction? We want to strengthen that. We want to strengthen your faith so that you have a conviction about things that you can't even see. I can have a strong faith, a strong conviction in something without having to see it. I can believe in love. I can't see it. I can see the results of it. I have conviction that I need to be a loving person. There's lots of things that we need to have a conviction about when it comes to faith. Let's look at those and we'll just lump all these together. I need to be convicted about three things basically here. Convicted that there is a heaven. If you don't think that there's a heaven, then obviously you have a faith problem. You need a conviction about that. Yes, there is a heaven. And I get to be there someday with God. First John chapter 5, verse 13 says, I write these things so that you may know that you have eternal life. I was talking and studying with this one guy, and I, you know, he asked me if I was going to heaven. I said, yes, I believe I'm going to heaven. He said, well, then you're, you're prideful. I said, no, I'm not prideful. I just trust God. My trust is not in me. It's not my ability. I trust God. He promised me that I can know that I have eternal life. And I have that conviction based on my study of Scripture. And every time I read the Bible, it strengthens my faith. Isn't that amazing how that works? My conviction comes from reading the Word of God. And every time I see that in Scripture, it's like, yeah, yeah, I am right with God. I am getting to go to heaven. And not because I'm perfect or because I think I deserve to go, but because I trust Him. I have a conviction that there is a heaven. I also have a conviction there is a devil. You know, if you don't believe in the devil, he's got you right where he wants you. You have every reason to believe in the devil as you do to believe in God. The Bible talks about both. There is a devil and he is out to get you and he is out to discourage you and destroy your faith. You need to have a conviction that the devil is there and he is trying to destroy you. And then thirdly, I need a conviction that there is a mighty God. There is a God who loves me, cares about me, and wants what's best for my life. I need that conviction. Our faith can grow. Our faith can progress. It is God's desire for our faith to progress. And as we progress, there's actually different levels of faith that we go through. In the next class, I want to teach you the five basic levels of faith. Now, these levels of faith are actually in the Bible, not, not the names of them. I, I made up the names. Uh, but they, the principles there, the scriptures there, the examples of biblical characters, you'll be able to say, here's levels of faith that we go through. Much like we go through stages of life, we go through stages of faith really hope that you will be with us in our next class as we talk about the five levels of faith. I want to teach you those and then I'm eventually I'm going to teach you how to figure out what level of faith that you're at and how you can move on to that next level. Sure hope to see you in the next class. Thank you for being here today.